you speak about uh, uh, photonics. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Some semi reduction of Fovian thermics in condensed matter. Please. All right, uh, my name is Alex Surgeon. I'm a postdoc with Mikkel Rexman at Penn State. And I'm here today to, as Fedor had said, talk, tell you about photonics and uh, while semimetals and while points and their observation in uh, photonics. So uh, this is some work, the observation of a while point as by a graduate student in our group um, from a couple years ago. You might have seen the paper. And I'll also be spending a great deal of the talk talking about um, non-hermeticity and its effect on uh, topological physics and while semi-metals, and also some experiments we've been performing to uh, elucidate the physical nature of non-hermeticity. So um, it might be useful to start off with an overview of why we care about topology in photonic, uh, photonic systems. And then I'll go through the experiment we did um, of observing while points and waveguide arrays. I'll then give an introduction to the non-hermitian non topological physics with an emphasis on its, uh, how it applies to while semi-metals. And I'll tell you then how we've observed what might be the fundamental or the first, the first uh, real demonstration of non-hermitian non topological physics in uh, a photonic system. This is a while point, turns into what's called a while exceptional ring, and we were able to see one. And then I'll conclude, if there's time, I'll conclude the talk by talking about um, other unique topological band features that are present in non Hermitian uh, systems um, that uh, you can't find in, in Hermitian physics. So the fundamental reason we care about non Hermitian, or uh, excuse me, the fundamental reason we care about topological uh, properties in photonics has to boils down to a compu this boils down to a uh, devices standpoint so uh, as you may or may not know when you send your data out to a data center you know these large cloud computing centers owned by Google Amazon Facebook etc um, Connecting all of the different nodes of their servers is optical fiber. We don't use w electrical circuitry anymore for connecting, say, a motherboard to another motherboard. We use optical fiber. And this fundamentally comes down to both speed and energy. Once the, the more, uh, there's a certain distance over which it becomes energetically favorable to send your information as light, to take your electrons, turn them into an optical signal, and send that and receive that and transform it back into an electrical signal to operate on it than it is to just charge a wire and send a current. And uh, that's the scale over which that energy requirement matters is decreasing. So right now, if you were to look at a modern CPU, about half to 80% of your energy is being used just in routing the information through the chip. They're no longer, the energy is no longer being dominated by the energy use of transistors. It's being dominated by the energy use necessary to keep repeating a signal across these tiny little wires traveling through, um, traveling through the, the architecture of the chip. And there's a nice, very nice review of this by David Miller, who's at Stanford, um, from a couple years ago in an IEEE Journal of Lightwave Technology. And, I, you know, even, even the chip manufacturers, so this is a talk from um, Gary Patton, who's uh, used to be at IBM. And even, you know, even Intel and IBM are looking forward and saying, hey, look, we care about needing to route information through a chip or through a motherboard, not just between different racks in a server, but within a single motherboard or chip uh, to have an optical nature, optical level to it so that it becomes more energy efficient to transfer information around our computing architectures. And so what this boils down to, why do we care, you know, I'm telling you a story about energy and I need to tie this back to topological photonics, 
And the reason that we care about this is that the more logic that you can perform at the photonic level, the better off you're going to be. It costs you energy every time you take your photons and turn them into electrons to operate on them. And so if you have some simple logical elements that you can construct using photonics, and you can put those simple switches or uh, uh, you know, diodes at the, at the photonic level, then you, it's, it'll end up saving you energy in the end anyway. So the kinds of uh, optical logic elements that we care about adding topological robust to are initially going to be things like initially going to be things like isolators and circulators. Currently, these are made using the Faraday effect. So you need uh, special materials, and you need, of course, need to sit a magnet on top of them. And that means they're fundamentally limited in their size and weight by the fact that you just need to sit a neodymium magnet on top of the device. Um, you need optical diodes for things like protecting lasers and amplifiers from feedback. Uh, communication systems, so transceivers that you would need in radios or um, airplanes. And for fiber optic sensors. A couple other things that it would be nice to add topological uh, physics to are large volume single mode lasers. So this argument, uh, why would topological physics, so uh, Dirac points or Weil points, be interesting for making lasers? Well, because they have a fundamentally different density of states at the degeneracy. Normally, you are limited to quadratic uh, band edges in photonics, but with, while with topological physics, you might have linear band edges, which have a lower density of state, and of course would then make it much easier to create single mode lasers, because there are fewer available modes in the system which could laze. Uh, the final uh, reason that we care about non-Hermitian physics in photonics, or one of the final reasons, is that they're right at the boundary while points and other degeneracies are right at the boundary of where you find interesting non-Hermitian topological physics. Um, and I'll talk more about this later. So we were able to uh, observe while points in the optical regime um, in waveguide arrays. And so this is probably not an audience that needs a review on what a while point or while semi-metal is. But of course, as everyone is aware, they are these degeneracies that are completely robust. Between them, you find these uh, Fermi arc states, uh, surface states, and of course they are robust to perturbations because all of the Pauli matrices are present in the Hamiltonian. Uh, they are associated with a magnetic monopole of the Berry curvature. They provide all sorts of novel behavior in condensed matter systems, which I'm sure we've been hearing all about. Uh, they're associated with a topological phase transition, and uh, they're still allowing for, potentially allowing for large volume single mode lasing. Um, of course, while points have been previously observed in both uh, microwave photonics so and uh, tallium arsenide, among other now more recent experimental demonstrations. Uh, and there has been a great deal of progress towards developing while points at optical scales. So the previous, this previous demonstration in photonics was using the microwave. This device is this big, it's enormous. So can we scale this down to something that you could you know, actually use or, you know, not use, but as a stepping stone toward uh, communications arrays. And so there have been a number of proposals by a number of different groups looking at how you would create uh, optical while points in, in at much shorter wavelengths. Um, in, uh, but none of them had yet borne fruit. So uh, in our group, and this work was primarily performed by uh, the graduate student named Jiho No, we'll be defending soon, but um, we are, instead of looking in photonic crystals, which is, had been the dominant portion of this, or in this, this laser pointer, nope, there we go. This system is an acoustic system, um, but instead of looking at photonic crystals, we're interested in studying this in helical waveguide arrays, and uh, these are, so you t these are laser written, so you take a piece of glass and you etch in one of these waveguides using uh, a very high power laser. And, uh, and then you would, once you have the, once you have the uh, waveguide written into the glass, you would then butt couple a uh, optical fiber up next to the waveguide from the edge. You shine the laser through and you use a camera on the back end. So what this video here is showing you is a simulation of when you take light and you put it into, say, one of these waveguides, 
what, as it propagates through the system, that light spreads out across the array of waveguides. And at the back end, depending on the length, see here you can see it again, depending on the length at which you kind of chop the system off, um, you would see a different pattern. So fundamentally what we observe in these systems is you stick light into one or a few of the waveguides at the front and you look at what comes out the back. It's a real space measurement. And here, and the index of refraction. Refraction. So these, these waveguides are created by making a, uh, perturbing the index of refraction of the glass. So glass has an index of refraction of 1.47. When you etch in one of these waveguides, it changes actually by 10 to the minus 3. But given the very large forward momentum in the system, this very this very tiny change in angular, this very tiny change in index of refraction actually provides very strong confinement. So these systems tend to act uh, very much almost like tight binding systems, actually. Um, if you, in general, if you have your favorite tight binding model and it doesn't require too many next nearest neighbor interactions, you can probably figure out how to turn it into a, a waveguide array. Delta N is the variation of the waveguide relative to the, the background media. So this is, yep, this is on the order of 10 to the minus 3. And that in, uh, is kind of balanced by the fact that K0, which is the base momentum that you are propagating with down the, down the waveguide array, is, is quite large. Most of your momentum is forward. <coughs> Delta N is small. K0 is large. So these are uh, described using this envelope, this paraxial approximation. Can I stop these noises by doing something with this? Anyway, these uh, these approximation, these uh, systems are handled treating um, the electric field paraxially. So we're going to uh, say that the second order derivative of z is very small relative to the first order derivative. This yields. Um, the paraxial equation, which has the same structure as a two-dimensional Schrodinger equation. Um, but you can actually still view this as a three-dimensional system, especially when your waveguides are changing in the as a function of z through your system. And the way that you can see that this really is defining a three-dimensional band structure in the same way that you would think about it in a condensed matter context is that although we've only explicitly written the derivative in terms of x and y, of course, there is a derivative in terms of z, and you are setting the frequency of the system when you set k0, your initial momentum through the system. So you take your laser, you bring it up to your wa helical waveguide array, you put in a certain wavelength of light that you're controlling from your laser, and so you can now, this equation you can think of as solving for your allowed uh, forward momenta, kz, as a function of kx, ky, and your frequency which of course is just a relationship that you can invert to find a more traditional band structure. Um, so the specific waveguide array we're going to use to realize an optical while point is a bipartite helix array. So these guys are all circulating. They're all circulating actually in the same direction. But the, uh, the two different colors of waveguides here are offset by a, a phase of pi. So the green guys are, are forward by 180 degrees relative to the, the blue guys. And uh, distance. Distance. So you're hopping, if you think about this from a tight binding perspective, your hopping coefficient between these guys is just changing, is, uh, is dependent on the distance between the two neighboring waveguides at a given slice. Ah, yeah, so the electric field is localized to one of the waveguides, but it has some evanescent tail, and that evanescent tail overlaps with a neighboring waveguide, and then it's that the, the amount of the tail that overlaps with the next waveguide that would actually give you rigorously. Yes, the electric, the electric field profile in one waveguide for a mode localized to one waveguide overlaps with the second waveguide. Yep, so the, uh, the distance, say, between these two waveguides would be uh, 16 to 24-ish microns. Um, so the, the spacing between these guys is quite small. Actually, these were a bit larger. These might be closer to 25. 
uh, the, the distance in Z. Each spiral is a centimeter long. Yeah, these, so these, the total system length that we're going to be talking about here is either four, eight, say, centimeters in length, which is going to be, and the, the, the helix period is about one centimeter. Uh, carefully. <laughs> say again. Uh, no, you just, so when you're, oh, no, come on. When you write it, you just focus, you can get different depths by changing the focus length of this laser. So you would, you know, you can imagine going up and down by changing the, the slightly modulating this, yeah, modulating the focus, and you can just drag the laser physically left and right to do this. These, you would actually, um, I'm saying you drag the laser around, what you really would do is the stages that you are mount have mounted the sample to would move up and down, and the stages are extremely expensive, and they have 20 micron or 20 nanometer precision. So these are um, the you get the helices with very careful fabrication techniques. Uh, what is the physical aspect of this picture? So uh, if you imagine just taking your light and you stick it in one of these waveguides, say here. Uh, at some point, so this is showing a, um, an evolution as a function of z uh, of the system. So, but at some point, you'll see that the simulation restarts there, and you put light in in one waveguide, and as it propagates along, it spreads out amongst neighboring waveguides. So that initial pulse, which is completely localized, through these couplings between neighboring waveguides spreads out. So what you're watching is just a basically, you know, the physical implementation of a tight binding, what you might think of as a tight binding system. Negative? Uh, yes, so we have not thought about this from the perspective of metamaterials. Um, I don't know of any work which thinks about waveguide arrays in, uh, in metallic structures. The usual problem with metallic structures is, is that they're extremely lossy, so you, but uh, maybe. Okay, so uh, this helical waveguide array, um, all of these waveguides, the, the offset phase between the, the two sublattices of the system as a function of propagation distance through the system are all moving towards and away from each other. And it's this, uh, it's this Z-dependent interaction or Z-dependent coupling strength, which actually gives this system uh, a few while points. Um, we're only get, we're gonna focus on these two because they correspond to light that's moving in the forward direction. But of course, this is a time reversal symmetric system. It's just index of refraction and, and a modulated index of refraction in, in glass. Um, so there are equally two while points that are uh, for light propagating in the backwards direction. If you were to turn your experimental setup around, you'd still see while points. And um, we can then go about observing this. So this is a, uh, an actual picture of the helical waveguide array. And if you do careful numerical simulations, you find that uh, between say about 1500 nanometers, a, wave, a light wavelength of 1500 nanometers and 2100 nanometers, you should be able to observe uh, Fermi arc, um, the Fermi arc surface states. The, our experimental range is going to be limited to about this part of this plot. That's just based on the laser we're using. There's nothing fundamental about that. And by changing the lattice spacing uh, between neighboring unit cells, as well as changing the wavelength of light that we're looking at, we can then tune the system through a while point. So this is before the while point, this is after the while, or at the while point, and then here is after the while point where we would expect to see Fermi arc-like surface states. Uh, and to identify, so we can't, these are simulations, we can't physically measure band structures, at least not yet. But um, so to, to recognize that our system actually has a while point, we need to look at the real space manifestations of, um, of what, what the consequence of having a while point in the system would be. And that is connected to the fact that there's a conical dispersion, at least in the x and y direction. So because these are waveguide arrays, you're seeing uh, type 2 while points, as in in 
the kx and ky directions, you have the two different um, bands have opposite group velocities. But in the kz direction, uh, in the z direction, both both uh, bands corresponding to light correspond to light moving in the forward direction. So this is just a different type of while point. It's called a type two while point. Um, and uh, but we are going to be most focused on uh, the effect in the transverse direction. So what's happening in kx and ky? And the real space manifestation of having a while point, which is a conical degeneracy, is that all of your light should spread out. And if you're at the while point, it should maximally spread out because all of your group velocity is moving out and it's big. Whereas if you're away from the while point, you have some hyperbolic dispersion relation and so some of your light will stay in the middle. Um, and so we will recognize that we have a while point based on the fact that as we image what's happening on the back end, we should see maximal spreading. And when you do the experiment, that's what you see. Yep. This picture? This is, a, this is now real space. So these are the helical waveguide arrays. I'm gonna put light, we're gonna stick it in the front of the waveguides, and we're gonna look at what comes out the back. Totally real space now. Yes, so let me use this next picture to do it. So uh, a while point, at least in the transverse direction, so in the, uh, in the x, y direction here, the while point, of course, is conical in those two directions. Um, and so, and if you're anywhere, back, if you have either, if you're, say, before the while point or after the while point, you have, uh, if you launch a pulse into just one or two waveguides, you are, of course, exciting uh, a large area in momentum space. Um, so if you are sampling a large area of momentum space, say, before the while point, you're going to see some of the light stay in the middle because there are parts of this uh, band structure that have are flat. And you're going to see some of the light move toward the edges because there are parts of the band structure that are, are um, vertical. And the same thing is true if you're after the while point. Parts of this have uh, no group velocity, and parts of this have positive and negative group velocity. Whereas right at the while point, everything is moving out. So if you put light in the middle of the structure, everything is moving out because you have this linear dispersion relation. So when we, what we're seeing here is exactly that. When we put light in into a system that is before having a while point, a lot of the light stays localized to the center of the structure. If we put in light after the while point, some of it spreads out, but some of it still stays localized to the structure. And if you put light in right at the while point, you see that that light uh, maximally moves away from the center of the, of the structure. And you can come up with some metric that measures that. And then you see that the while point is at the dip of this curve, which is showing how much spreading there is. Um, the second thing you can do to show the green, uh, the green dots are indicating where light was injected into the system. Yeah, you're putting it in two, and they're uh, coherent, so it's they're you're, you're getting the same phase of the incident light in both of these. Um, you want to put it in two. It's yeah, it, there's an experimental advantage to doing it with two rather than one, but it's. Uh, the second thing we can do to observe that we have a while point is we can look for the the. Uh, Fermi arc surface state. So if you put light in on the edge and you have the existence of a Fermi arc surface state, the light should stay localized to that edge as you look down the system. And if you start with without a while before the while point, and as you slowly transition to after the while point, you can see that the light is starting to to localize and, and transit along the edge. So revealing the existence of a Fermi arc like surface state here. Ah, there it is. There we go. So this is this was the uh, this is the first experimental observation of a while point in a photonic system at the optical wavelength regime. Um, and uh, and now I'd like to go on to tell you about uh, introduce you to non-hermitian while semimetals. So uh, which yield a new class of topological phase transition. And before I really delve into a non-hermitian while semimetal, I I should 
take a moment and tell you about uh, a unique kind of feature in the band structure of non-Hermitian systems called an exceptional point that you may or may not be familiar with because they do not exist in Hermitian systems. So uh, to, to begin to introduce this, let's just imagine a very basic s system, um, two coupled cavities or resonators, and uh, with this two by two Hamiltonian. But what's gonna be different about this is that I'm gonna add gain to one of these resonators. I'm gonna add loss, excuse me, loss to the other resonator. And if you just, of course, calculate the spectrum of this, you'll find that you, this is, you have this square root dependence of the coupling minus the non-hermeticity, the strength of the non-hermeticity, this strength of the gain or loss. And what this means is that when you look at the band structure, you start off with two bands, but at some critical amount of gain or loss equal to the coupling strength between the two, uh, between the two resonators, your two uh, eigenvalues coalesce, they become degenerate, but it's actually worse than that. Um, the two eigenvectors of the system become equal. So this is a non-Hermitian system, you're not necessarily guaranteed orthogonality of all your, all your eigenvectors, and, uh, and at this point actually what were two independent the linearly independent eigenvectors before become the same eigenvector. Your system becomes uh, system becomes uh, defective and has a non-trivial Jordan block form. Afterwards, you recover linear independence of your eigenvectors, and uh, the two eigenvalues become their real parts stay equal, but their imaginary parts become different. But right at this point, where the two eigenvalues and eigenvectors coalesce, that's referred to as an exceptional point. Um, and they are one of the, as I'll talk about a little bit more, they are in the neighborhood of exceptional points, you're extremely sensitive to small perturbations. So if you change your system by some amount epsilon, your frequencies, some small number epsilon, your frequencies change by the square root of epsilon. So that can be a significant enhancement if you are have devised a sensor that's looking at eigenvalues. Um, Yes, so one of these resonators has a little bit of gain, the other one has a little bit of loss. They don't, they, we've set it up here such that the gain and loss are equal, it doesn't matter. You'll see the same physics just offset um, if, if, G's, if, the, if G1, if you put G1 and G2 here. How can we create gain? Uh, well, in optics, you know, it's you just put a gain material <laughs> in. <laughs> Right, anytime, anytime you write down a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, there are some number of degrees of freedom that we're, we're ignoring in the system. So that would, in this case, correspond to whatever happen is happening in, in, say, some semiconductor gain medium that we're, we're integrating out. Um, there are a bunch of mathematical properties of exceptional points. So right at the exceptional point, your two eigenvalues become equal, your eigenvectors become the same, they become self-orthogonal. Remember, your left and right eigenvectors are not uh, related by complex conjugate or uh, the adjoint because it's a non-Hermitian system. And it constitutes a bra branch point. Uh, the eigen in the, if you want to expand in a perturbation series, the eigenvalues near the, uh, uh, expand in the perturbation series, what the eigenvalues look like near the exceptional point, you would use a Poisson series. So this is where these fractional powers uh, of your perturbation come into play. This is, this is, uh, so this is the underlying reason why you get this enhanced sensitivity, potentially, near uh, exceptional points. Um, ah, that enhanced sensing. And uh, they, in exceptional points actually are also inherently topological, not in the same sense as a topological material, like we're familiar with from condensed matter, but there is a winding number that's associated with them. So because they constitute a branch point, um, you have to wind around this guy four times, or twice, excuse me, four pi, to get back to where you started. Um, and this Riemann sheet topology actually can be observed in, uh, ex in experiments. It was both, a, both an experiment from Stefan Roder's group and, uh, oh, he's at Yale, I'm forgetting his name, anyway. Um, so why should we study non-Hermitian systems? Um, they yield to all sorts of strange counterintuitive phenomena. So loss induced, this is a demonstration of a loss induced transmission that somehow, as you keep increasing, if you have two adjoining waveguides, as you keep increasing the loss in one of them, uh, when you start decreasing the loss, the transmission through the total system dips. 
but then as you keep increasing the loss, the transmission starts to recover. That's strange. The same thing, actually, the same that phenomenon is related to loss-induced lasing. So we have two ca laser cavities here, and we're going to put loss in one of them. And as we start to increase, we've put loss in um, both of them, and we've put gain in one of them. And as we start to increase the gain in the other to make the system more homogeneous, in a sense, you actually see lasing turn on and then turn off, even as you're putting more gain, total gain, into the system. And then as you keep adding gain to the system, the lasing turns back on. So this is, it's strange. Um, you, uh, non-hermeticity and these kinds of ideas of patterned gain and loss actually lead to very stable single mode lasing structures. Um, there's this enhanced sensitivity based on the square root or higher uh, uh, root behavior leading to better sensors. And uh, it also allows you for arbitrary control over pairs of polarization state, so if you want to separate polarizations or, or um, merge them, uh, you can't do that easily with Hermitian optics. In fact, you can't do it at all with Hermitian optics. Um, Birefringent materials uh, will rotate you around the Poincaré sphere, but two separate polarizations of light always have a fixed relative angle between them. But non-Hermitian materials, uh, you can. Why should you study non-Hermitian topological materials? Um, so in photonics, there's a pragmatic argument to needing to understand non-hermeticity and topological context, and that's because photonic structures radiate light to space. So uh, we are, free space is a conductor for light and um, for just about every wavelength. And so whenever you have some structure, say like this canonical demonstration of a topological insulator in helical waveguide arrays by uh, Rexman, um, this device is shedding light to the environment. Um, and uh, here's a photonic crystal slab that is shedding light to the environment. And so the fact that the environment is conductive for, um, for light means that whenever we want to, you know, we never, whenever we want to talk about topological properties, we need to very carefully understand what's happening at the boundaries. And so uh, it's, it's important to uh, study non-hermeticity and Photonics to just very carefully understand, you know, how should we, should we really call this a topological insulator if it's shedding light out the side all the time? Um, all right, there's also a hopeful argument. So besides the pragmatic business of we need to dot all the, dot all the I's and, and cross all the T's, non-hermeticity offers all sorts of unique features. So um, topologically robust uh, sources of lasing, which were recently both theoretically and experimentally predicted by the Segev and... Um, uh, Mercedes Kanakaya, um, oh, what's her last name, at uh, the Creole, um, uh, kind of Uh And then there's the there's actually a new kind of topological phase transition you can get in topological non-hermitian materials, uh, and that was something I predicted with Shanwei Fan while we were while I was at Stanford as a postdoc. Um, and then why should we care about non-hermitian while semi-metals? Um, as I'll show you in the following slides, while semi-metals actually are a pretty exemplar system for uh, how to start to think about non-hermeticity in topological contexts, there's been an enormous amount of work in the past couple of years really starting to try and understand what's happening in non-hermitian topological physics, and there are still uh, a fair number of open questions and disagreements about how to actually start categorizing these systems. But in the case of non-Hermitian while semi-metals, there are some things that we definitely know and you can prove. And then there's now, as, uh, as I'll show you, we now have started to experimentally observe some of these features. So um, we want to start by studying just a simple while Hamiltonian. Um, this again has this conical to dis uh, dispersion relation we're all familiar with. And let's add just some basic amount of non-Hermeticity to the system. And uh, of course, this is going to make our eigenvalues um, have this have this little minus tau squared in the middle, and this means that there's going to be a ring of exceptional points in the kz equals zero plane. Turn on laser. All right. Well, you can see the ring over on the side, and um, there we go. So this ring, this ring over here for when tau squared is equal to kx squared plus ky squared and kz is zero. This is, I should note, not any sort of 
PT symmetric system, all that's been broken by the existence of the while point. And so what this band structure then transforms into is that you open up this, this uh, while, this, this ring of exceptional points where the two bands are degenerate. In the middle of this ring, the complex, the uh, eigenvalues become complex conjugates of each other. And you have this interesting tachyonic dispersion relation. Um, of course, this is for when, this is, uh, this is for kz equals zero. But if you then change it to look at, if you slice through the exceptional ring in a different direction, you would see, you would bisect just the ring at these two points. So you would see two of the exceptional points. And here you can really see the effects of the Riemann sheet topology of the system. So these two bands that in the Hermitian system you could think of as independent, but to, you know, touching and degenerate at this one point, really in this non-Hermitian context are two just two different parts of the same Riemann sheet. Um, so you would still need to wind around any one of these exceptional points by four pi to come back to where you started. And so you let's let's now look at what is the topology of the system. We had a we started with a while point that has a magnetic, you know, corresponds to a monopole of very charge. And what what happened what happened? Is that still there? Is there any sort of topological protection? So we would need to, to begin to answer this question. We need to slightly redefine what we mean by Berry curvature because we have left and right eigenvalues uh, or eigenvectors and they're different. Um, not simply not simply related. And uh, in this case, let's define the Berry curvature um, or Berry connection to be uh, the left and right eigenvalues. And then let's go about calculating the Berry curvature and integrating across a surface to find the Berry charge of these now while exceptional rings. And what you find is that, uh, so defined, if you choose a surface which encloses the entire ring, you find that the while charge is still completely quantized. Whatever while charge you started with uh, remains. And that if you choose a surface that is, say, even in the middle of the ring but doesn't contain it, uh, you get nothing. There is no, uh, no Berry charge associated with that. Um, and it turns out, actually, that even it doesn't really matter what choice of left or right eigenvectors we use. We can use any set of, the, any set of combinations. And they, upon integrating across the surface, they'll still give us the same answer. So the topological charge is robust um, to your choice of left or right eigenvectors upon integrating across the full surface. These are going to be locally different quantities, but the, the surface integral is the same. This even works. So uh, this original paper uh, demonstrated this, this, this conservation of charge just for simple while points, but this even works for an, a system with an arbitrary, arbitrarily charged while point. So you've, as, uh, you're probably aware, while, charts can, while points can have higher uh, charges than just one. And uh, you can go through the same uh, mathematics and analytically prove, actually, that given a Hamiltonian with an arbitrarily charged while point, that whatever, that whatever charge you started with before you added non-hermeticity, you end up with after the hermeticity is added. What does this look like? Well, let's say we take a charge three while point, and you can again see this Riemann sheet topology through the system and branch cuts uh, along, you know, when you, when you are bisecting uh, parts of the exceptional ring. And um, you may then ask, well, what happens if I have two while points? And they are connected, of course, by fermiaric surface states. What happens if I start to add non-hermeticity to two neighboring while points? Well, each one will turn into one of these while exceptional rings. And as we start to increase the strength of the non-hermeticity, these two while exceptional rings can touch. So as the strength of the non-hermeticity increases, the rings expand in their radius. And when they touch, the two rings merge and they lose their while charge. So whereas before they touch, you would have a one ring with the charge of the first while point and the second ring would have the charge of the second while point. Once they touch, you just have a single while ring and it's chargeless. They're not, depending on your distribution of gain and loss, they're not guaranteed to touch. They could just sit. 
Um, yep. Say again. Ah, do you want to see this in a real system? Is that what you're asking? Here's a real system. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, yeah. So what what's being plotted? Uh, what's being plotted here are the real and imaginary parts of the eigenvalues, and their intersection is where the while exceptional ring is. Um, so th there's two these these red there's the red uh, spheres and there's the orange sheet, and that's the intersection of these two surfaces that is the while exceptional ring where both the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are completely uh, the same, completely coalesced. So these blue these blue rings at the intersection between these two surfaces are showing you where the while exceptional ring is. So it's when these two blue rings touch that you lose your charge. And the, the point here is that you, your blue rings might never touch depending on the distribution of the loss in your system. Um, which is then you would just never see this new kind of topological phase transition. But we can put this in a real system. So this type binding model is associated with a, uh, a metallic photonic crystal. Uh, you take beams of metal in air, array them in the, uh, arrange them in the system. This has a charge two while point. Um, actually, is two, one at gamma and the other two at the top and bottom of the Brillouin zone. And then a bunch of charge one while points uh, through the system. It's a three-band model. Um, but uh, as you start to add gain and loss, say, to two of the layers of this system, the while points first expand into these kind of contours. They're not, they can be more complicated than simple rings. But um, say this, this guy in the middle here will eventually merge with the two while points on the edge, and they will both lose their charge. So what is happening in this process is, ah, so the Fermi arc states are connecting where they would start by connecting the projections of the two while points under the surface of the Brillouin zone. They now connect the two, uh, the projections of the of the while exceptional rings. And as the rings merge together, you lose your Fermi arc surface states, right? So I don't actually have a, a cute picture of this, but if these two orange bits were touching each other, there would be no space in between them for the Fermi arc surface states to exist. Depends on how you cut the surface, right? So uh, you're projecting this ring onto uh, onto the surface, and it, it you know, for these more complex shapes of contours, it depends on how how the surface is cut, what the projection looks like. So uh, we can actually observe these while exceptional rings, um, and uh, so to do that, we'll start with the same bipartite helical. Uh, a waveguide array that I showed you before that we could see a while point in, because of course we need to start with a while point if we want to observe one of these rings. And we're gonna, we can actually add this gain and loss to the system. So I'm showing you simulations right now of adding a phenomenological gain and loss term. What would happen if we actually were able to physically put absorbing and gain material into the waveguides? And in these simple systems then you would see, you know, in these um, uh, thought experiments, you would be able to see this this ring actually appear right where you had the while point before. Um, uh, there's so there's the while exceptional ring. Um, and how would you? It's maybe first important to say how would you distinguish a while exceptional ring from a while point? And again, these are helical waveguide arrays, so we are forced to measure their real space the real space phenomena. And uh, but you would be able to see first the existence of chiral edge states because uh, so long as the you haven't had these two contours completely merged together, which they definitely won't for this system, because um, the, the while points are very far away in physical in, in f the physical parameter space. Um, but as you transit through uh, the where the the while point is, you can see the existence of these chiral edge states and. To observe uh, 
a while point, we looked for conical diffraction. So we started with a pulse, say, now across many waveguides. We, these are type binding simulations of the waveguides. Upon propagation over many distances, you would see this conical diffraction. And if you started with a pulse of light at the in a in a while exceptional ring, though, in the middle here, in between the two bands, it's completely flat. So we've taken a point, we've expanded it into a ring, but in between, in the middle of the ring, the surfaces, you just have two touching pancakes. And so what you would see is that the light would spread out a little bit, but not a lot. And, and you definitely would not see this ring-like uh, conical diffraction. Um, so uh, that's the signature, is that based on as you increase the strength of the gain and loss in the system, you lose this conical diffraction of the system. And uh, that's, that's what we're going to be looking for, one of, the, one of the things we'll be looking for when we observe this in our physical system. So, of course, I said we can't really add gain and loss to our system. How are we going to make our system non-Hermitian? But the answer is we're going to take our waveguides and we will just add little breaks into the waveguides. And you might say, well, how are you going to cut your waveguide? And the point is we don't cut it, we just don't write it. So you would go along, you'd write a portion of waveguide, and then you would stop writing for some distance, and then you'd keep writing it again after that distance has passed. And doing so, actually, you can get a very reliable, very controllable method of adding uh, non-hermeticity to your system. And so this then realizes your non-hermitian term. At these gaps in the waveguides, you shed light to your environment, and that's your loss. Um, so you can do full Maxwell uh, simulations of, the, of this system to confirm the presence of the ring. This, this bumpiness is actually due to the diagonalization procedure necessary to calculate this. It's not, um, these are not experimental. Um, but uh, you can, you know, if you, if you look closely, you, you can see that this, there's this ring and it's taking up, you know, some non-negligible fraction of the, of the Bruan zone. And so, um, we can now do the same, basically the same two experiments that we had done previously. We can inject light in a side and look for the appearance of Fermi arc surface states. And as a function of sweeping through the parameters where you would expect to see the while ring, you can see the appearance of Fermi arc surface states along the edges here. Whereas before, the light would just spread straight out to the back of the system. Here, the light stays nicely confined both in simulation and experiment to where the to the edge or the, the surface of the system. And uh, we can also look for the disappearance of conical diffraction. So before when we had a while point and the light would maximally spread out through the waveguide array uh, when we injected into the center. Now when we uh, inject light where there's where we're at the while exceptional ring, the light stays completely confined to the center of the system. And so this lack of conical diffraction, while still having a topological transition, is the characteristic signature of a while exceptional ring. And so, uh, laser, uh, we, you know, if we could turn this into a gain system, we definitely would. But <laughs> getting the gain media into the glass is, is a bit of a trick. <laughs> um, so. Uh, but yeah, so this is the first experimental observation of a while exceptional ring um, ever. Uh, and it was just published a couple months ago. Um, and maybe also from a mathematically more interesting, uh, interesting perspective, this is the first observation of a distributed source of Berry flux. So one of the things that we're always told about while points are, are is that they are these magnetic monopoles of uh, berry charge, or uh, berry flux. And this now is a ring on which the berry charge is quantized and preserved from its original while point, but it's not, you know, there's no interpretation of this as being a monopole. This really has to be thought about um, as some more complex object. Um, and the final part of this talk, I should just, I want to briefly introduce that there are other kinds of uh, interesting topological features band features that can be found in non-Hermitian systems. And the specific example I'll go through is a, what's now being called a bulk Fermi arc, as opposed to an ordinary Fermi arc, which exists on the surface of a system. So if you remember when we were, I was introducing what a while, the while exceptional ring Hamiltonian looks like, 
and how you get these while exceptional rings. I showed that you, you know, I mentioned that if you slice the ring, uh, if you bisect the ring in some sense, and you see a band structure that has just intersects the ring at two points, so you have these two exceptional points. In between these two exceptional points, you have you find this line on which the uh, the two energies, the two eigenvalues, are completely equal. So this is referred to, but this is part of the bulk spectrum, not this isn't projected to any surface. So this is has been referred to as a bulk Fermi arc in the in the literature. Um, and uh, so this, this, this line of, of degeneracies of the real part of the eigenvalue. And this has actually even been observed by the Soyacic group. So they used a photonic crystal slab, and they observed that as they swept through their wavelength, and they could see different contour cuts of this band structure here, that they started on one end, and they saw the, this open, uh, the, the two separate, you know, that you had a full curve, and then they were able to sweep through where the two, the two eigenvalues became degenerate and then out the back end. And actually, some of our own work has revealed the existence of, ah, here we go. Some of our own work has revealed the existence of uh, bulk Fermi arcs in contexts that we didn't expect to find them in. So this structure uh, is a system we were using to look for a photonic crystal slab embedded in a three-dimensional photonic crystal. Uh, was a structure that we were using to originally search for what are called bound states in the continuum. So states that are completely bound to the slab and cannot radiate despite the existence of a continuum of states available for them to radiate into. And as we were looking through, as we were doing our simulations and looking through the data, we noticed this funny quirk that one of our lines of bound states in the continuum uh, was ending. So this system is, is rather uh, unique in that it exhibits uh, one-dimensional lines of bound states in the continuum, which is a bit atypical, though not totally unknown about. Uh, but we noticed that the line was just, we were looking at only one of these bands, and we noticed that the line was just ending. And when we zoomed in, we actually saw that this line of bound states in the continuum was moving through these, the middle of this bulk Fermi arc as part of this Riemann sheet topology of the system, and that the, the bound states in the continuum were still completely there uh, along the line, uh, uh, along this high symmetry line of the system, they just, you know, from our conventional way of thinking, they had switched from being on one band to the other band, which was uh, quite unexpected. So, uh, this is, yeah, so this is a physical, manif a, a physical manifestation of the Riemann sheet topology of the system. So, in summary, uh, I've, been, I've been telling you about opti uh, while points and the realization of optical frequencies as well as, and then we spent some time discussing uh, this new class of topological phase transitions in non-Hermitian systems and the realization of a, a while exceptional ring. And then uh, some, uh, a bit of time on these non other uh, band structures. It would be remiss not to thank uh, the various people that uh, did all the work uh, and, and or helped do the work. So Jiho No was the lead graduate student on uh, observing the original optical while points. Uh, uh, Wade Chia um, Wade uh, was our collaborator for the bound states in the continuum project. Edong uh, was our collaborator for the observation of the while exceptional ring. Uh, Shanwei was a collaborator of mine when we were originally developing some of the theory of uh, uh, non Hermitian while systems. And then, of course, Mikhail Rexman is my boss. So, thank you. <laughs>